what better way to wrap up your WrestleMania weekend than hanging with us three here on the Wrestling Inc. podcast as we finish it all. We wrap it up in a nice old bow as we officially turn the calendar page to a new year in WWE. Pleasant good evening, everybody. I'm Justin Labar, coming from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, here hosting you on the Wrestling Inc. podcast tonight while Jack Farmer is out. And joining me, as always, in normal on a Monday night, he's fresh back from Philadelphia. Yes, they let him into the U.S., and then they sent him back to Toronto, Ontario, Canada. <laughs> he is a referee extraordinaire for over 20 years. The man's main event, uh, or the man's refereed, rather, a few WrestleManias, including one uh, major main event with The Undertaker. He is a best selling author. He is a coffee aficionado. He is a chef. He is a husband. He's a dear friend. He is Jimmy Corderas. Jimmy, how are you? I'm I'm so stoked. I'm I'm exhausted from this trip, but at the same time, I am pumped up. I, all of the above. I, it was such a great weekend getting to catch up with some old friends and some new friends. And uh, you know, the one that steers the ship, my beautiful wife, was accompanied me for the first time ever on a wrestling trip. She had never gone with me anywhere. She would not come. I would invite her, come to WrestleMania, come here, come there. She would never come. This trip because I didn't have to actually work work so to speak. Uh, she came along and we had a blast. She got to meet everybody and got to meet some people that she knew from back in the past. So uh, it was fun. She fun. never, I mean, cause you got, you were with Dodie for at least what, seven or eight years after you guys got married, right? I mean, she never went to a mania. We were, we were 10 years together when, uh, okay. when I was working for WWE, she, she popped in occasionally at the, you know, house show in town, but she never traveled on the road with me. That was the one thing she never wanted to do. And, she kind of wanted to keep that separate, so and it, and it worked. Now she's stuck with me twenty four seven. She's kind of regretting things, but hey, what can you say? <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say it. It must have worked. Here we are in twenty twenty four. You guys are, are, are together and happy and in love and life. So good on you. Yeah. Yeah. Joining us uh, tonight, not with us every single Monday, but he's become a, a wonderful uh, addition when we're mixing the crews up. He always brings uh, a fun point of view from where he sits. He is the one, the only Matt Coon. Matt, how are you this evening? I'm doing great, man. I, I did not go to Mania or any other things this weekend, even though it's not that far away. But, man, I will tell you, it was quite a weekend, especially for WWE. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it. Um, I was. I was also Matt. I was not in Philadelphia. I uh, hung back uh, to be in studio to host Boston Open both Saturday and Sunday morning. Um, you know, I had a little bit of FOMO, uh, missing out, seeing Jimmy and such, and them there, but uh, but still got to enjoy the spectacle, the granddaddy of them all on on television and all that that offers. Uh, and let's talk about a little bit of WrestleMania first. We'll talk a little bit of WrestleMania. Uh, we'll get into a few news headlines, and then we will get into Monday Night Raw uh, rather quickly because it is a huge Monday Night Raw, as always to be expected. Huge following yeah. WrestleMania. Uh, so night one and night two obviously the, the big story i think everybody else we will we will touch on in some capacity but the big story of course the thread through both nights is the bloodline and their threat to the company and their threat specifically to cody rhodes and seth rollins night one jimmy we see the final boss get the pinfall victory on cody rhodes so now cody has to go into night two knowing he's going to face roman reigns with bloodline rules just makes that mountain even steeper and he's got the psychological aspect of dealing with he just got pinned by the guy who he's had such a personal problem with in The Rock. Uh, again, Jimmy, you were there. Give me your, uh, just real quick, your emotion, uh, your temperature after you saw night one, knowing we still had an old, a whole other night to go with the story. It uh, Like I pumped up now, it pumped me up even more back then, being there and witnessing it. It was just amazing. You know what I mean? It, it set the table for what was to come. Everybody talks about, okay, what's going to happen night two? What's going to happen night two? The other thing that people forget is what's going to happen the night after night two. You have to set the table there. And as we'll talk about later, they did exactly that. And it was beautifully done. It was well handled. And I think it led into night two. And, and when I say set the table, it definitely set the table for night two. Matt, I don't know about you. Um, I, I, I was not expecting that long of a tag team main event match by those four. Uh, not knowing what the Rock's you know, quite frankly, what you know, he's in phenomenal shape. There's a difference between being in phenomenal shape and being in ring shape. Uh, hadn't had a true match in 11 years since 29 with Cena, where he got hurt, by the way. So with him, and then the other three all having matches the next night, I just did not know what WWE was going to roll out there. What did you take on? I think it was like the second longest main event ever in WrestleMania history. What did you take about the match itself in terms of what they gave us in terms of length and and, and how they set it up? And what did you uh, feel after the outcome? Well, I didn't see as much of a 
thread between like night one and night two as a lot of other people did i do think you know the rock it was about the rock the rock did 12 weeks of wrestling training it's a tag team match so the rock did not do that just to make a cameo i mean or the original plan is the rock's going to wrestle a big match against uh roman reigns so he wanted to get some ring time he wanted to get in there he wanted to show that he still had it and also make an impact i don't think there was that much mystery like it wasn't like I was thinking, well, what's going to happen is, are are the, are we going to get the scientific one-on-one fair play match between Roman and Cody that we all want, or are we going to get massive shenanigans? And I think we all knew we were going to get massive shenanigans, but we did not know we were going to get such well-organized shenanigans. So night one was a great show. It was a good show on its own, but night two, man, that was it. Yeah, night two followed up, and again, we go back to the main event. Uh, obviously, you know, you got... Cody and Roman doing what they can do for however long they did it straight up one on one, and then the final five minutes where it was uh, as everybody's using the the, the comparison uh, uh, Avengers Assemble. Of uh, mm-hmm. uh, obviously we know the lineup that the Bloodline has present, and one by one Cody Rhodes had an answer. Jay to neutralize Jimmy, John Cena to neutralize Solo, which makes sense because Solo last took John Cena out, so that makes sense. Seth Rollins, I'll be your shield and shield gear coming to try to take on the final boss. And uh, Roman gets a chair shot to Seth's back. So payback all these years later, nine years or whatever it's been later. And then finally, the Undertaker to uh, to to put down the final boss and let Cody and Roman finish it in honest. Matt, um, you like all of us, you know, you've you've probably seen every all 40 WrestleManias now you've seen a lot of wrestling in your life not just WWE but concerning WWE and WrestleMania would you say that this is up there in the argument of one of the greatest endings to a WrestleMania you know recency bias is a thing but so is nostalgia right and in this case man I don't know how 10 years from now you don't see this was the greatest main event of all time you know it's not just this guy runs and that guy runs and this guy runs and it all made sense. Even the Undertaker, who some people think replaced uh, Brock Lesnar, some people think he replaced Stone Cold Steve Austin, mm-hmm. that made sense to me because you know it, it, Roman beat the Undertaker. Roman had that Raw after Mania where he was booed for ten straight minutes, and uh, the the set thing was particularly detail oriented and well thought out. He sat there. And Roman Reigns could have easily taken a chair to Cody, but Seth propped himself up in a way where Roman could not resist the shot. And that's what cost him. It just, just (laughs) tell a story. I mean, that's, you want to talk about storytelling and matches. Uh, I, I, have I ever seen a better example? I don't really know. Uh, a great point, Matt, that you make that that Seth basically knowingly sacrifices himself, l- lured, lured, reeled, mm-hmm. rather reeled Roman Reigns in <clears throat> to dispose of that chair shot. Uh, Jimmy, uh, we had Triple H kick off night one. We had Stephanie kick off night two, both emphasizing Stephanie very, very much so uh, in a very cool way using the DX words, uh, putting over that it is the Paul Levesque era, that that is the right. era we are in now. Paul Heyman put it over huge at the Hall of Fame speech Friday. Uh, I don't think we can get this coherent and detail-oriented storytelling at this point if it's anybody else other than Triple H, but I think this really showed uh, his... This is going to be a fun era. It, it absolutely does, and, and I know uh, Paul Heyman, of all people, knows exactly what Triple H is because he's worked with some so closely over the years, and Paul Heyman's not a guy who sugarcoats anything. He'll tell it like it is, like you saw at the Hall of Fame speech, which was probably the greatest uh, uh, acceptance speech in Hall of Fame history. It will it was wonderful. And Stephanie coming out and putting over her husband uh, and the way she did it. And I find it interesting, though, that they, they said in some ways, well, I think it was Paul Levesque, and I'm not sure where he said it, that they're welcoming Stephanie back home where she belongs. We have we don't know what capacity yet. I haven't seen that, but that's yeah. that's interesting as well. But this Triple H era, this Triple H regime is a new direction that you're taking. Uh, going back to the main event match, you can see it there, the way it was laid out. I know the guys obviously in the match were put a lot in, had a lot of input to it, and he listens to that because he is that accepting as opposed to being the boss. That, you know, I hate to put it on the performer uh, boss, but you, no, you're not. That's not going to work. You're going to do it my way. 
He listens. He says, okay, that sounds good, but how about if we do this? And puts little tweaks and changes, tightens the screws, as I like to say. And I love the way that they spaced out bringing out those legends. They didn't, you know, it, it wasn't rushed. And it felt right. Everything felt right. And it was done in a way where people went home happy. And they anointed Cody at the end, raising yes. him up on their shoulders and basically signaling that he is the future of this company. Yeah, very, uh, very Brett at WrestleMania 10 esque of all the baby mm-hmm. faces out there hoisting, hoisting Cody up. Uh, and yet, to the point of Stephanie, um, yeah, we don't know. Uh, that is one thing that, that that did not get asked at, at the press uh, press conferences, unfortunately, afterwards by anybody. Of um, obviously, she's there supporting her husband Triple H and what have you. But is she in fact back? are going to be back in some official title role at Titan Towers. Uh, so we will uh, have to wait and see. I what... think we can we can take inference that Endeavor TKO uh, feels confident about uh, Triple H and Stephanie and even uh, my old friend Bruce Pritchard uh, mm-hmm. as far as not being involved in any of the uh, scandal that involved Vince McMahon. The fact that they put him out front, put him on TV, had him speak for the company. If they had any doubts at all, I don't think um, they would do that. So I think that bodes well for WWE as well. I, I think I, I would tend to agree with that as well. Um, you know, yeah, I, I would agree. That, 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 that I don't think they would flippantly just, yeah, I think that's well said, Matt. Uh, a super chat here as we're talking about uh, Mania and how great this past one was. Uh, Reaper bring 499, thank you. Uh, I was at WrestleMania 3. Uh, I've become slightly jaded with wrestling. But this is the best ending of WrestleMania, period. So a very cool super chat from somebody who was there at the Pontiac Silverdome in 1987. And we're talking about, I mean, what what is a better ending than three? You know, this guy was there uh, probably as a kid. I mean, to compare this one to that one is insane, but it sounds right to me. It's just the perfect Hollywood ending. Mm-hmm. It, it was it was exactly what it needed to be. Spring it was. Sun- it- it was. So WrestleMania, uh, it is 40 is wrapped up. <clears throat> and now we come into Monday here as we, again, this is where the WWE calendar flips to a new year. Uh, let's hit a few news headlines uh, just before we step into Raw. First off, we'll uh, talk about this one. Uh, according to Fightful Select, MLW World Heavyweight Champion Jacob Fatu is telling people he is signed with WWE. And I don't have it right in front of me, but I believe I saw something that might have been PW Insiders further confirmed that, that this is in fact the case and I, that, that Fatu even might have been backstage tonight at Raw. Of course, he is a, a cut of Usos and Solo and Roman, so uh, a, a legitimate addition to the bloodline it seems to be inevitably coming Jimmy Corderas. Yeah, it, it act, the, all these signs are pointing that way, and sometimes it's good to be somewhat predictable, but at other times you don't know what's coming down the, coming down the pike. So who knows? Maybe there's a little something in play here. Uh, I, he's an excellent talent. He belongs in the in the big leagues. Let's uh, you know put it that way. But uh, Jacob Fatu is a good get, and it fits perfectly with the bloodline storyline. Maybe there's some tension now going to build between Rock and Roman. Maybe Rock goes up to Roman and says, "Hey, you couldn't get it done. You're you're the head of the table. Well, the final boss is going to have to take care of things that you couldn't take care of." So. Let me bring someone in who I think can help this bloodline. And he's part of our bloodline or something along those lines. But, um, yeah, it does very well look like he's going to be part of that bloodline storyline going forward. And you have to add to it to make it different from what it is now. Yeah, and Matt, in that, in that same spirit of what Jimmy just said, if the bloodline is going to continue, but you have to do a new chapter and kind of keep it fresh and kind of you know add some participants in it, uh, Jacob Fatu signing, obviously, again, logical there. Uh, he, I know people have had their eye on him for a while. He's done a lot of great things in MLW and around the independent circuit. But WWE also, currently, if especially if they want to extend the bloodline into the women's division, they have Nia Jax there, who's part of the bloodline. They have Naomi, who is now married in the blood. They have Tamina Ava. Snuka. They have Ava. So there are, So I think I think there's a lot of potential in this, in this again, new WWE calendar year for the bloodline to expand and have a fresh coat of paint, so to speak. I like all the, the women ideas. You know, as far as Jacob Fatu goes, you know, Jacob Fatu is very much like your best case scenario as far as how good Solo Sokoa can get in the ring. Jacob Fatu is a talent. He is fantastic. He got in some legal trouble early in his career, 
And I think WWF held on, uh, held WWE held on a few years to make sure, you know, that's not who he is. And it appears not great talent, good guy, just an outstanding in ring performer. People are going to be surprised at how good he is. Um, uh, and also, uh, Tama Tonga, I believe, has signed with WWE. And so when you look at, um, you know, their fight, and Jimmy can probably, um, attest to this, that they very much consider themselves cousins. They very much consider themselves, um, you know, family members when it comes to um, Haku and yes. his family uh, and and uh, and the bloodline. And also, if you think of a tag team called the Islanders a long time ago, oh, yes. uh, one of their fathers was the Tonga Kid, and the other one of their fathers is Haku, and now they're both with WBE, so they might do something with that as well, and that excites me as well because those were two great wrestlers, and their sons are also two great wrestlers. The Samoan pedigree is just ridiculous. Uh, there, <laughs> there is, there is, something, in, there is something in that DNA that the, people got to get a hold of somehow. <laughs> <laughs> there's a there's a thought to that you know like it's a cultural thing in a lot of ways and i don't mean uh race what i mean is uh, how many nba players have you seen who have kids in the nba right and uh you know kobe bryant it's very much to me something like well this can be done it's an impossible dream for a lot of people but we see it can be done guys in our family do it and then you see it again and again and again and again it's a culture of success and a culture of uh dreams realized and uh, this family ain't no stopping because I bet they're making kids right now that are going to be running WWE uh, 20 years from now. Incredible, incredible. So we'll keep our eye on that. Again, all yeah. just more reasons to be excited about where the booking could be going. What's up, Jimmy? I know it's just something off, the, uh, again, uh, off topic a little bit, but one of the best lines in Hall of Fame speech by Paul Heyman was when he was talking to his daughter. And if anybody gives you trouble, Haku is only sitting two seats away from you. <laughs> and I was there and I've seen that Haku, the one that comes out sometimes. He's the sweetest man in the world, the nicest guy, but he's the one guy you'd never want it to tick off. That's for sure. Oh, I mean, yeah, the 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 the, the stuff that his the, the stories, his legend is just incredible uh, of yeah. the uh, of exactly what you said, being one of the most likable guys in the locker room to the boys. Uh, but good lord. If, if if the if the wrong jabroni who wants to tell him and challenge him <laughs> wrestling's fake in a bar. <laughs> oh, uh, no! But here's the thing, though. He would warn you first. Please stop, or this is going to end not, not end well for you. And they yeah. would keep going. They push his buttons, and that that I, would, that, I wouldn't that, stop. You know, that, that seemed stop. to be that seemed to be a courtesy from guys of that generation. I know somebody who uh, a little bit older than me, but I know somebody in life who. Um, I think this is back in like the, the late somewhere in the eighties, they were uh, in line to board a flight uh, behind Rowdy Roddy Piper. And they thought they were being funny and, Oh, Piper, I, I think I could take you and trying to do that, that typical kind of thing. And Piper turned around and said, sir, I'm going to ask you once, please stop talking this way. Otherwise you're not going to like where this goes. <laughs> it was that courtesy yeah. <laughs> because I'm going to have to defend the you business. If you keep going, you get one pass. You, yes. You, by you the way, not... ha Haku was responsible for this, by the way. This that little nice. pinky figure. And that was just him coming in to break up a pin on a tag match. And he stomped on my foot, on my finger with his foot, barefoot too. And he actually apologized to me. And I went, you, you don't have to apologize. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Wonderful. All right. Well, sticking with the uh, news of who are free agents who are not, Matt Hardy is reportedly now a free agent. And he is done with AEW. Fightful Select reporting that uh, Hardy and AEW were in some negotiations for a new deal, but in the end, uh, Hardy has uh, rejected to stay with AEW. Uh, Fightful Select also went on to say that AEW, uh, I don't know I don't know what grounds or how, but they say that AEW added a few weeks to Hardy's contract to ensure that it went through WrestleMania so there wouldn't be any uh, surprise WrestleMania appearance. I, I assume maybe there's some injury time that they were able to cite. Yeah which would tackle in weeks. Um, so Matt Hardy gone from AEW. Uh, Sean Ross Sapp of Fightful does note, though, Jeff Hardy is still part of the company, and that's relevant because uh, if you listen to Matt in, in his podcast, a lot of interviews, he se seems to want to stick with Jeff in, in whatever they can both do as they close down their careers. So uh, Matt Hardy, Matt Coon, uh, no longer with AEW. Are you surprised by this at all? Not really. You kind of, um, and, and I like Matt, you know, but you kind of sense the air of, um, I don't want to say desperation, but uh, air of uh, importance of him really wanting to resign, him really wanting to 
you know, be an important spot with AEW. I'm sure the contract he was offered just wasn't a very good contract. And um, I hope uh, he figures out what he wants to do, and I hope things go really well for him. But quite honestly, you know, AEW's got a very bloated roster. And again, I like Matt, and I like Jeff. Uh, and um, I hope uh, they find a good place for him. And WrestleMania would have been great for him to debut, but I guess it's not meant to be. Yeah, uh, Jimmy, I know that before Matt ultimately signed with AEW during the pandemic, I know that he had had some conversations with Triple H about maybe what is there something that he could be doing in NXT. Ultimately, that did not happen. And of course, this is again when when Vince is still running WWE. Um, you know, Matt's four years older now. I, I don't know how many miles he has left in the ring, but I do wonder if he could be a real valuable asset in the NXT world, not necessarily as a performer, maybe a one or two offs. If, 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 if this, if, this, if the situation is there, but more so as behind the scenes as a, as a trainer and or producer. He absolutely can be because Matt Hardy is an asset, not only in the ring, he's also in, an asset in the locker room backstage and also helping with creative. He's got a, he's got that mindset that he could help in all aspects of this business. And, you know, it, even if it doesn't work out for him to go to an NXT or WWE in general, where he could be, like I said, a great asset, maybe a TNA could use him and help yeah. develop that talent. Because you were seeing Triple H now extending the olive branch to other promotions. And we saw that at the Royal Rumble when uh, when we saw the NXT, uh, the sorry, excuse me, the TNA talent showing up in the Rumble and that sort of thing. So there is something maybe in play there. Maybe he could be that conduit between the two brands and help, you know, negotiate things or make things work out there. But, uh, yeah, Matt Hardy can, is definitely one guy that could help out in all aspects of the business. So we'll keep an eye on uh, what the future holds for Matt Hardy, and I guess now we'll definitely keep an eye on uh, whatever Jeff Hardy situation is in AEW and uh, what timeline that might uh, inspire for things. All right, final news item real quick before we get into Monday Night Raw. Uh, it appears that WWE is going to be bringing back the king and queen of the ring tournaments to Saudi Arabia for the for a premium live event. Uh, the next one, uh, the next uh, event in Saudi Arabia for the WWE is going to be May 25th in um, uh, in Riyadh, I believe. Uh, so mm -hmm. May 25th, 2024. So j just to take a look at what WWE's got their schedule coming up, they, they're going to do Backlash in France on May 4th. And then three weeks later, they will do their this, the, these two tournaments in Saudi Arabia. And then about, uh, I want to say, um, five or six weeks after that, in, in early July. Or, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Before that, they have June, they have Clash of the Castle in Scotland, and after that, they have in early July, Money in the Bank. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Jimmy, they are rocking and rolling right now with content of all types, because you have Backlash, which is, you know, the kickoff of, again, the new calendar, new new year with new champions. This tournament's going to be its own thing of, of crowning tournaments for men and women. Mm -hmm. Clash of the Castle, very much you think is going to have to be built around Drew, so what's that going to materialize, and then Money in the Bank. This is, this is an insane uh, lineup they got coming right now. Hate to sound like Captain Cliche, but strike while the iron's hot because this product is hot right now. People are invested. And why not do these premium live events? I love the fact that they're going to different locations like France, like Scotland, like, uh, well, Saudi Arabia. We know they go over there, what, twice a year, I believe the deal is that uh, they have in place. They're coming, they're going international, even Canada, technically international, even though it's North America, but even coming to my hometown, which is going to be fun. So, uh, yeah, it, it makes perfect sense to schedule these they're not they're might some people might say they're crammed a little too close together but then again why not it's it's better than having trying to have a pay-per-view every week <laughs> so to speak matt are you a fan of the king and queen of the ring tournaments generally sure i like them i think it's good to have tournaments when you don't have that many of them you know when you have an occasional every few years uh, title holding uh, tournament these you know saudi arabia you know, there's always issues at play when you have like a woman tournament in Saudi Arabia when they were just allowed to wrestle there and they still have to wrestle in like a full bodysuit. Makes it makes it hard to love. But as far as the international pay per views go, or the PLEs, which I believe stands for Paul Levesque era, um, I, nice. the, the, um, I, I think it's hard not to say that what AEW did in uh, London was not kind of proof of concept of a lot of this stuff. Where it said, okay, we'll just go to these countries once in a while, we'll get a huge house, and we'll we'll extend our brand. 
And while AEW was struggling with with attendance in America, they were able to sell, you know, that 80,000 tickets. So I think it was further proof that, hey, there's international soil to be toiled by uh, wrestling companies. And the way they're going about it seems to be uh, smarter than I would, anybody I know would even think of doing. Nick Khan is a genius. Yeah, and as Bernie in D.C. notes, uh, just kind of point out the the specifics of what I just laid out there. So France, Saudi Arabia, Scotland, and then you know, Canada for Money in the Bank, all before finally coming back to U.S. soil in Cleveland for SummerSlam. So, I mean, you know, when you're just when you're this hot, WWE is as they travel uh, the U.S. Uh, a couple times a week, now they're going to make the U.S. fans have to sit out for a little bit. And get thirsty again before they come back for the next for the second biggest event of the year in SummerSlam. So it really is just a great touring strategy at this point. They've got America. Yeah. They've already got yeah. America. You know, and and like like you just said, we're 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 going. Oh my God, when are they coming back? Like they've already got us. So what they're doing, it is just insanely smart because everything is a net game. Everything they're doing there is a net game. It's huge. And then as soon as they finish SummerSlam. Uh, later in August, at the end of August, they're going to go to Berlin. <laughs> so right. It's see, just... see, but like you say, when we talk about their television product, there's a reason for everything they do. Nothing is by accident. And there's a reason why they're doing this. And I think Matt laid it out perfectly. Super chat from Malik Black saying, enjoyed WrestleMania weekend, Dijak versus Ova versus Josh uh, match of the year. So cool. uh, we appreciate it there. Mm-hmm. All right. Let's, uh, let's go ahead and jump in to... As I move my, that was a great match and that was a great event. The NXT takeovers, mm-hmm. like if you don't watch wrestling and you just know you're gonna want to watch something good, a takeover has probably the highest ratio of uh, entertainment of any pay per view you could go to. It's always good. Yes. The only absolutely. the only sad thing about that Matt is, in my opinion, is it happens on WrestleMania weekend gets overshadowed by all the other stuff. So if it almost flies under the radar, but it is a great product that people should check out. And I don't. I know we're the age now of content consumption, where everybody just consumes content at some point. It's it's why we can get away. It's why they can get away with elimination chambers airing at, you know, five a.m. Eastern time in America, if, if that's the case, because it's just everybody consumes differently. But I I remember the days before Mania was two nights where NXT was Saturday night in the arena there in that same city, and it had just such a big fight feel. There's something about it being in the middle of the day that's, you know. Take, to me, just takes a little bit away. Once you watch a show, the matches deliver. I mean, so once you watch mm-hmm. it, but there is something, you know, as they're trying to, uh, you know, feature all this content, all this talent they have now. As someone who went to a lot of those takeovers um, before the, the WrestleManias, I totally agree with you, but I saw a strategy start to develop where I think they're really going to try to do like 20, almost 24 hour content creation during WrestleMania mm-hmm. weekend. And mm-hmm. if you remember uh, WrestleMania 34 in New Orleans, they tried to prevent other companies from having events. They, they got laws in, they got different zoning stuff in. And I think this is the new approach. They're just gonna have content all weekend long and make people choose between GCW and WWE or TNA and WWE. I see this as just one of many things they're gonna do over the weekend. Well, Matt, to that to that point, I think I, I think you're right. I think, and we saw they brought the Slammies back, and the Slammies were Sunday morning. But I think in that, I think they realized they can only stretch their their brands and their guys so far. I think they might start to acquire. You know, we saw they obviously had a very open working relationship with Bloodsport, the event this year. And, and and if you looked on the internet, there were many you know many WWE talents, Punk included, were at were there watching and Nick Khan <laughs> and Nick Khan, right? Yeah. So yeah. I think. You know, I I think I said this to Jimmy on a, on a podcast in recent weeks when we started learning about this. I would not put it past that, that this is Nick Khan and Paul Levesque feeling out this process and being like, you know, we're getting ready to move Raw to Netflix and we have the WWE Network on Peacock for for how, for how, however long that is. Are they looking at are some of these companies at this level companies that we could acquire in some form or fashion and they could be part of our around the clock offerings, especially on big weekends like WrestleMania? So. Mm-hmm. It's a wild time, wild time to be a fan. Great time to be us uh, hosting shows, talking about this stuff. Uh, Super chat here from Jake saying, and just like that, Mania Weekend is over. Back to our boring real lives, but glad to experience this as a fan. Safe travels, everyone going home. Yes, we can all agree with that. Hey, don't get off the ride just yet. You know, there's still a long ways to go, especially in this new Triple H era. Stay tuned. But, you know, when you go, and I know, Justin, you've been to some of these weekends as, as a content creator or maybe even a fan. 
they are exhausting when you oh, go yes. to a wrestling yeah. weekend. Like I have had tickets to the Monday after Raw and not gone because I was just burned out. Too much, yeah. too much wrestling. Takeover Saturday, Mania Sunday, spring break, all the other stuff going on. It's exhausting. So good luck. Uh, drive home safely, all you guys who went there, and take a few day break from wrestling. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah, I, I mean, I, this, I know, this sounds silly to say next to Jimmy, who's... <laughs> And I, right. I've been to I've done eleven manias, and I did nine of them as con, as a content. You know, two of them I was there strictly as just a fan. Um, but even when I went as content person, I did not ever take the press ax the press box access for mania because I always wanted to sit amongst the crowd. I wanted mm-hmm. to I wanted I wanted to cheer. I wanted to sweat. I wanted to drink. I wanted to do all the things as a fan. I didn't want to have to, you know. But you're right; it's a marathon to the point of where it's like people don't realize. But never mind the events, but you're all you know, you're networking. You're networking. Mm-hmm. You, you, you know, I would host a tailgate many a times. I would host a chair shot reality live event where we'd have like because you're trying to do things to, to put your brand over and what have you. And you're right. It is an exhausted to the point of that's kind of what inspired. Everybody's like, why didn't you just drive across the state of PA and go to Philly? And I was like, I want to do a good job with Busted Open and I can't right. host Busted Open two mornings in a row. And do Philly the way I would do Philly. Right. It makes that, sense. That, that candle's going to burn out quick. So it's but- just. Yeah. But the be- beautiful thing about WrestleMania weekend, though, before we get back to Raw, is that they have so many talents at their disposal. Not only current talents, but but Hall of Famers and legends that they come in and do the, the autograph signings at the rest- wrestling world, at the WrestleMania world, at the convention center and all that sort of stuff. And it's just a, it's a spectacle. I walked through there that one day um, um, and just checking out these all these different things they have a ring set up they have a stage set up everything's going on over there they have some classic sets they had the old uh oh, oh what is it the um in your house in your house yeah the in your house set which uh I, I look back at it it reminds me of the old calgary one that they had back in the day so, so i was having like flashback a mania for me <laughs> that's awesome yeah it's growing it's getting bigger and bigger uh makes you wonder what the hell's wrestlemania 50 gonna look like right Oh, wow. All right, let's, jump, let's jump into Monday Night Raw. They are finishing up the residency in Philadelphia. They're back in the Wells Fargo Center, the same venue that hosted the hosted SmackDown, hosted the Hall of Fame, hosted NXT. Uh, packed, over 20,000. Again, small entranceway, no, not even a Jumbotron, not even the Titan Tron, because that's how many seats they need to, they have filled that need visibility. Uh, just I agree, and Jimmy. I think that is smart. I think smart. the visual of it just being slam-packed is better than the Titan Tron every time. If they can do that, they should they should start having that as an yeah. alternate plan. I, I agree. You know, they're in Montreal next week, and I don't have the exact numbers in front of me from WrestleTix, but I assume that it's probably close to sold out because that's just what they're doing right now. I, I would go for that setup. Yep. I, 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 would, I would go for it. I would too because when you talk about hot Canadian cities, you know, you talk about Toronto, Montreal is ranked up there close number two. Yeah, the yeah, I got home uh, like uh, 20 minutes after the show started, and like I was like, "Oh, are they in the garden?" Because he came out of the vomitorium, you know. And I was like, right. "Oh, they must be in the garden." And then I was like, "They did not. They did not strike the stage." Shirt sure, 20 grand, man, 20,000 people. That's that's a big that's a big chunk. And you yeah. save money on production costs, that's for sure. And setting it up and all that sort of stuff, you know, little things. <laughs> Well, and they did the same thing in Chicago a few weeks ago, right? Mm-hmm. They had that house was all state was so packed that they took the Titan Tron out of that one too. So, yeah, yeah, maybe that's where we're going. All right, uh, so let's uh, again with Raw for those of you on the podcast who may or may not know. Obviously, we just did our news. Not going to go in order of everything in that happened in in, in from eight to eleven Eastern time. We're going to kind of go in level of uh, importance and or topical connection. But this one is what kicks off the um, the majority of the first hour, which the first hour was commercial free. We got Cody Rhodes. He's out there. Uh, he's, he's introduced by Paul Levesque. Uh, a wonderful video tribute uh, is is played, uh, showing Cody's journey, uh, not just his current WWE journey, but kind of his entire career journey. Um, and then after he has his uh, love fest with the crowd, <laughs> enter the final boss. The Rock hits the ring, and there's a lot of a lot of what's a lot of a lot of a lot of words said to Rock by the fans. But the bottom line is. The Rock says to Cody Rhodes, "You may have finished your story with Roman Ro- with Roman Reigns, but your story with me has just begun." Uh, Rock notes he's going to go away for a little bit. That's what everybody kind of figured. Nick Khan even kind of confirmed such in some interviews uh, that 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 Rock has Hollywood commitments. So Rock's going away for a bit, but he tells everybody he will be back and he will be coming. And he tells Cody, "Whether you're the champion or not," which Matt, I like this because had the Rock made this about. 
I'm going to get this because at one point the rock wants to hold the title and everything had the rock said, I'm going to get this title. I'm going to get this title. Had he made so much of this about the title and said, I'm coming back for you. You know, then it puts that thing of, okay, now do we just know Cody's not losing it until we see rock again. But I like rock saying, whether you're champion or not, I need a piece of your ass. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, the whole thing was pretty good. Um, I will say we got a little view into what might've been because why does the rock have a title it really only makes sense if he fights roman right like if he has this belt this weird belt that he has like there's no reason for him to really have it and then uh the fact that the rock comes out with cody on monday not roman you know roman's nowhere to be seen i think maybe the rock was supposed to win the match i, I don't know um you know but it was a good segment the only thing that I didn't like, I guess, is I'm used to seeing the big new opponent come out. You know what I'm saying? Like, Cody's the champ. We get the celebration. But then here comes blank. And you're like, oh, no, it's even bigger than I thought. It's, you know, so we didn't get that. But I think, I don't know, considering Cody, it was a Cody celebration. And I do believe he handed him a lighter or some matches to say that he's the one who lit the bus on fire. Well, yeah, so I was going to get to that here in a second. So, I, well, first of all, Matt, I, I, I kind of know what you're saying. I was expecting to know who Cody's ex opponent was going to be tonight, but we have to keep in mind the other world title clearly is going to stay on Raw. Cody's probably going to be seen more on SmackDown. So, tune into SmackDown. We'll probably get the answer there of who on the roster. So, Jimmy, uh, as Matt was just alluding to, as The Rock signs off with Cody, he says, I got The Rock says, I have something for you. It's right here in my pocket. Pull, pull your hand out. And The Rock never reveals mm -hmm. what he's cupping in his hand. And Cody never shows it. But he, he he hands it off to Cody and he says, don't ever break my heart again. So obviously, whatever he handed Cody, again, Paul Levesque, long-term storytelling. We're going to get back to it eventually. Mm -hmm. Whatever it was, whatever that object was, it was small enough to be cupped in a hand. So lighter, matches, watch. I've heard a lot of things speculated on social media. Uh, what did you make of this entire exchange? The fact that we know Rock is coming back at some point for Cody and then whatever this mystery sentimental object is. Well, first of all, I'll start with the rock coming back. Eventually, I like the fact that they planted a seed for the future. That's for sure. The one thing I would have, this is just me, that I might have changed is when rock asked to hold the belt, maybe Cody could have said something along the lines of, you want to hold this belt? You're going to have to beat me for it. Otherwise, you don't get to touch it. Or something yeah, along yeah. Real lines. quick with that, even even the Philadelphia crowd, who for the most part was loving all of this, right? Mm -hmm. And they're playing along. They're still cheering Cody, even when that title exchange was happening. The fans started chanting, "This is awkward." Yeah, exactly. Because it was pretty awkward. I had the feeling that maybe like Rock improved that, yeah. Like let me hold the belt because it was so strange. And it seems like you know the Rock is always. Um, you know, got that big Dwayne energy, and he likes to throw it around. So that might have been one of the things, like, I'm going to ask him to hold the belt, see what happens. Yeah, yeah. yeah so, it, Jimmy, so, sorry. Yeah. So, yeah, so no. keep keep going here. No, I just, uh, I did I did like the exchange they were having because, like I said, they're planting the seeds. Now they could water it slowly. They don't have to, marin you know, make it crash and burn. And then you could slowly develop who's going to be the next contender for Cody until that time comes and it probably we're going to wait till SmackDown before the ball starts rolling in that direction. And there's a lot of guys you can pick from. Like we talked about Gunther is now not no longer intercontinental champion. He could be a contender. We've got the draft coming up soon. So that could put some other guys in play and it's, 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 it's getting compelling as far as what was handed to Cody. I know a lot of, like you said, a lot of people are speculating, was it matches or a lighter or something along those lines? Was it uh, the watch? And if it is the watch, how did he procure it? That's an well, interesting thing. Well, I, 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 this is where I'm confused. I've seen a lot of people speculate a watch, and that would make sense because something you could. But I, maybe I'm missing something. And, and Cody made it. A, Cody made a point to say at the presser after he won, and then he did it again on Pat McAfee today. He was wearing a gold Rolex, and he said that this was gifted to him by Triple H, Nick Khan, and Bruce Pritchard. That it was the watch. They they tracked down the watch that Dusty pawned for Cody to go to acting school in LA. Mm -hmm. So what other watch is there out? If that's the watch, like what other watch is there? That's like, did, did rock go in his dressing room and take the watch while he wasn't, you know, wasn't in there. Like right. that it's gotta be something like along the lines of maybe the lighter or maybe something that we weren't thinking, thinking outside the box. And when he presents it, people go, Oh, now it clicks. Cause Whatever remember rock said, don't ever break my heart again. Mm-hmm. 
I mean, that, that I guess that would lend to a light. Like, you know, you, I, I, you, you broke my heart. I, I, I had to, yeah. I had to commit arson. <laughs> I don't know. Right. <laughs> That's. I mean, it makes more sense with the watch, especially talking about the dads and how important that is. And one thing about the watch, like when he said uh, that that Nick Khan gave it to him, Triple H gave it to him, Bruce Pritchard gave it to him. I'm thinking, man, Bruce's best friend knows a lot about Rolexes, Conrad Thompson. Like Conrad is plugged into the Rolex world, and I would bet everything that conrad is the one who found that watch because that's something he would do yeah it would make for a great episode of the uh what's the the hidden treasures show yeah, yeah. yeah there you go. Great. <laughs> but what a great story for cody i mean how great is that that oh yeah here's the belt your dad ever won and by the way here's the watch oh my god what a day for cody he deserves yeah. it yeah All and right. one one last thing before we move on i just want to say that i know a lot of people are saying Cody's being a little too emotional and we want to see more of a different coach. No, this is real. This is actually real. And it, this is what sells. He's not the character Cody. This is, this is Cody Runnels yeah. that you're seeing well, on television. I don't know how anybody in the right mind, listen to the reaction that Cody Rhodes, a, a white meat baby face is getting 2024. Wh wh why are you going to tell him to change anything? He's obviously got something figured out. Yeah. So. Uh, I want to throw something about you guys real quick. Last, I guess maybe last point on this Rock Cody business as we move on to more. Uh, so I'm thinking, okay, so Rock, so we know, we now we know Rock is going to come back and fight Cody at some point. We just went through all the international shows; none of those make sense to have happen. Uh, SummerSlam in Cleveland, well, sure, but I'm sure there's probably a lot of other options again that could headline that that doesn't need to be. You know, then we start going around the pike, and all of a sudden you get around to the new year. And and yes, this could be something they could hold for Mania, hold for Rumble. But I also feel like you don't need even need this for Mania. I feel like next year's Mania there'll be something else. What about this? As a, just a picture, this the very first Raw of January is going to be on Netflix. What bigger of a debut could you make on Netflix if you sold out a stadium show or or even a packed arena like this, where you got twenty plus thousand in an arena? Closed dome arena that sounds the loudest. If you kicked off Raw on Netflix with the freaking Rock versus Cody Rhodes, you know, Justin, that's a great idea. I'm glad I thought of it. Um, really, <laughs> you're gonna have it, that, dude. That's like really. What is the purpose of a Rock Cody matchup? All the things you want from it, you would get from having it on that episode of Raw. Like you know, Rock is the you know, he's part of the TK board. You know that he's going to be he has been and is going to continue to be instrumental because he's worked with Netflix in his Hollywood career. So you know he's bridging a gap. You know he knows suits there. So what better of a start of the relationship? To say Best look, foot forward, man. I'm gonna I'm gonna lace up the boots, Netflix. I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna give you guys something. Here. Jason, uh, I mean Justin. Why did I say Jason? I don't know. But, but you see, my mind is clicking. You got my mind. Uh, going 900 miles an hour here how dare you make a make a suggestion that actually makes sense <laughs> business right business so yeah. but it is interesting to me that like now it's about rock and cody i guarantee january 1st or january 3rd which i think is when they actually met um is rock or cody was not on the rocks horizon at all he probably wasn't interested in cody he was probably looking at a bunch of other stuff and cody got himself in a position that this is Cody, right? Is he got himself in the position where now we're looking forward to rock Cody crazy. It's crazy how persistent and how persistent and how prevalent Cody Rhodes can be. It's, it's a, it's a good lesson for all of us, quite frankly. Yeah. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, where's it going here? No, Jason, everybody's loving the Jason, uh, Eric, there we go. Eric saying, is the rumble going to be on Netflix? No, raw moves to Netflix in January. Uh, Rumble and the PLE still next year will remain on the WWE Network, which is on Peacock if you are in the United States. If you're outside of the U.S., I believe, uh, Jimmy can attest to it, the network is still its own separate uh, app, its own separate right now, yes, yeah. platform. Uh, and that's for, and that, that, that's for through 2025. I think after 25 is when we'll have to see what the situation with Peacock mm -hmm. <clears throat> continues to be. Okay, so that's Rock Cody. Uh, certainly, uh, again, good way to occupy the majority of the first hour. Uh, we go from the start of the show to the end of the show. Drew McIntyre is part of this fatal four-way match uh, against Bronson Reed, Jay Uso, and Ricochet. They're fighting to be number one contender to be the uh, next challenger for Damian Priest, who is our new world heavyweight champion, who cashed in, of course, on Drew just five minutes and change after he won the title, uh, all because... 
of that damn CM Punk. What a great first segment or segment to WrestleMania uh, night two that was, wasn't it? Yeah. No, it was a great way to kick it off. Great, great way to kick off night two. And so Drew's out there cutting a promo, cutting. He's ranting on Damian Priest, calling him a bondage undertaker. He's ranting about Money in the Bank, which has cost him now <laughs> twice. Uh, he hates the entire gimmick, as he's talking about. And then, of course, he's ranting on CM Punk. Uh, and so then he goes into this fatal four-way match. And Ricochet and Bronson Reed look to have neutralized each other. Ricochet does an insane 450 uh, from the top rope to the outside of the Jeez. Spanish table. Look like the edge of the table called him right next to <laughs> That was painful, bro. Yeah, I hope he's okay. I, yeah. I hope he's okay. But those two are neutralized. So that leaves Drew with the countdown of the 3 2 1 lining up Jey Uso for the Claymore kick. And then all of a sudden, the camera pans out wide, and damn, CM Punk has just popped up. <laughs> Under the ring, ringside, whatever he did, and he's holding Drew's ankle that cost Drew the match. Jay Uso gets the win. So Jay Uso will go on to fight yeah. Damian Priest in the future here. But CM Punk twice in 24 hours has cost has knocked Drew McIntyre out of the world title picture. Jimmy, there is so much heat and tension in this. I, I like I, I can't imagine what's gonna happen when these two finally do have their match. It's going to be insane. It's going to be off the charts. And one little thing I want to bring up, too, is the way that WWE right now is shooting their camera angles. Because the way they shot this, you had no idea that CM Punk was anywhere in the picture. And it just came out of nowhere. And you got the reaction from the official reaction from Drew McIntyre before they panned down to see what the reason was for that reaction. And it was CM Punk holding his leg and not allowing him to do the Claymore kick. Little things like that. And even during the match, when someone's climbing up to the top rope and somebody's ready to do something and interfere, and that's that way in the four-way match, what you see. So when they pan out too far, you can see it coming. The way they're shooting it now is you see the person on the top rope and they come in in the camera shot out of nowhere. So it surprises people, at least the people at home watching on television. Obviously, the people live can see it happening. But little things like that. But this, this feud... Is really igniting. This is this is going to be. Uh, I hate to use the term again, off the charts. And Drew McIntyre is just hitting. He's not just hitting home runs. He's hitting grand slams every time he's out there and on the microphone. And it is brilliant to watch. And I'm a big Drew Drew McIntyre guy now. Matt, um, uh, obviously Punk had his famous two hour <clears throat> interview with Ariel Hawani last week, and uh, in that he basically kind of told us that his tricep injury which he had before on the other arm in AEW, that he's healing faster. He's rehabbing faster, and he credited WWE in their handling of it. But he gave off that he's not going to be out as long as he was in AEW. Uh, and it certainly feels like between him just slightly getting physical at Mania, taking that brace off and hitting Drew with it, and then this, when when Punk got hurt, I thought, okay, we're looking at SummerSlam or later, maybe even next year. This feels like this is coming in the next few months. And obviously we rattled off the events they have coming up, uh, this feels like this is coming. Do you agree? Uh, yeah, and especially since he wasn't wearing that brace on the pre-show. He wore it when he knew he was going to get some action. You know, it is not just the recovery. It's just the attitude. When you when you see, okay, at least in my head, I'm thinking, well, CM Punk's probably gone for a few weeks or whatever. And then you see him unexpectedly come up, Cheshire Cat grin, just grabbing the foot, and just a different side of CM Punk. But like Jimmy was saying, like you were saying, uh, we're all looking forward to this feud. Like, Justin, you were like wringing your hands together going, I can't wait for this match to happen. Mm-hmm. So, when was the last time that happened? Like, uh, it, it, it's, it just shows, we talked about the Paul Levesque era. Uh, Paul Levesque has had a chance to run NXT. He's had a chance to run WWE a little bit. But every time was under the watchful eye of his like, man. Yeah. This is unshackled, unfettered Triple H. And when it's all said and done, he might be the greatest ever to do it. If this is what we're going to see, this this Drew McIntyre thing is inexplicable how good it is. Yeah. And it's been executed perfectly by him. Every idea has been great. The back and forth, when him, him and Pump, the one-up and shit, everything's, everything's ringing true. And I want to see this match. Well, and I bring up the fact that this could happen sooner than we might have thought because, you know, you look at the events coming up, and obviously the, the – and Saudi, Saudi seems like it's going to be occupied again with this tournament. So let's take mm-hmm. that out of the equation. Um, it's they, don't need, they don't need it. They don't well, need it. They don't so. need it. Well, and, and so in the, the clash in June, clash of the castles being done in, in in Drew's home country of Scotland. That's which, it. Well, is it though? Because or, or is that the first one meeting between them? And I ask this because 
Scotland's going to want to cheer him. Is that part of the story where Drew's going to be like, you know what? I'm tired of being, I'm tired of you screwing me all around this damn country. We're going to go to my home turf. And they basically make Punk the heel at the show just for that live crowd. I mean, I, so I'm curious wh- how they do this or where they do it. So, Matt, you think do it at Clash. It's Absolutely. Kind of, and yeah. I think that's it. Because the thing about the Drew character, if you were to ask Drew about it, is his character has to feel justified in everything that he does. Drew's character is not a guy who's like, I'm evil, ha, ha, ha. His, his character is someone who feels justified very, 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 very much like Bret Hart in 97. Okay. It's basically the same thing. And would Punk embrace a one-night return to being a bad guy? Yeah, <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I love the idea. I love Punk and and uh, uh, Drew at Glasgow with a one-night Drew just being over like Grover and then yeah. one-night Punk being booed out of the building. And I could see Punk in that situation d- 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 to try to endear himself to the crowd coming out doing his best Roddy Piper cosplay or something. I love bag oh my goodness. Right. Yeah. yeah, no, I love that dynamic because like Bret Hart, when he was a heel all over the United States, every time he came back to Canada, it was all about Bret Hart. He got cheered, cheered, cheered. It was amazing. And this, I could see the same thing happening here. And like you said, Punk would love that situation for sure. So, uh, again, more good business to be done there. And, again, not to be forgotten, Jey Uso is now your number one contender. So, Jey Uso, uh, he will be next in line, uh, or first in line, rather, for the new champion of Damian Priest. I find that interesting and only because Jey Uso, obviously, the people are behind him. You see the yeet movement going on. Even Pat McAfee's <laughs> standing on the announce table doing it. Sometimes it drives the people insane, but that's a different story altogether. But it, the, people are having fun with Jey Uso, and uh, – I only don't want to see it, you know, I, I like Damian Priest. Okay, uh, let me backtrack a little bit. I'm going to admit when I'm wrong because you talked about how he cashed in the money in the bank. I didn't think it would be a good idea to do it at WrestleMania because this was Drew's time. I still think I still thought that going into the match, after the match and after the finish of what happened with Damian casting it in, it was the right call and they executed it perfectly. Yeah. So. Hats off to them, and I think Damien is a guy that they could hang their hat on right now, and 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 be on the rise. This guy's on the. We saw it coming while he's almost like taking over the uh, the um, Judgment Day. Yeah, and no, it's uh, sitting there. So yeah, yeah. Real quick on Damien Priest, uh, I'm I'm, yeah, I'm I'm thrilled for the guy. I mean, I and I think and I go back to this. Um, I you know I had posted a. I, I, selfishly to put myself over but also really in true celebration true celebration and, and, and to tout the privilege that i've had of so many great things i had shared a video clip of a video of a working priest a w- managing opposite him before he was in WWE, and it was just a fun clip of me managing wardlow up against him and, and i just but i just said i was like you know I, the number one thing i noticed obviously the guy had all the tools in the ring the look all that stuff that was obvious the number one thing that i learned that day spending the day with him was how professional he was and somebody asked like what does that mean i was like how you handle yourself when you're coming in and you're not a regular of a roster and you are somebody that's been on TV, you've been on ROH TV. How you handle yourself? Where do you dress? How do you how do you interact with the people you work with? How do you interact with the other people that are just there? Do you make time for them? Do you how do you interact with the people that run the building? How do you like it, it, the, and I just put over the just how professional he was. And then somebody's like, Well, you know, I still don't think that he this is my comment there. Somebody's like, I still don't know if he's ready. Why do you think they gave him the belt now? I'm like, look at you know, when he the way he handled the bad bunny stuff, both as being a Babyface partner with Bad Bunny, and then being an opposition with Bad Bunny. The way he took care of him, the way he did business, the way he handled the media. Uh, it's great that he's bilingual. That goes a long way. Like he proved to the office that he he can carry the company if, if they give him the proverbial ball, and they've now given them the the proverbial Monday Night Raw ball. And so it makes a lot of sense. I'm ha- I'm really happy for him, and I like Jey Uso as a first opponent for him because Jey Uso is a face that people are behind. Mm-hmm. But we all know Priest is not losing his first title defense. Yeah. But I feel like he can beat Jay, and Jay will still live to fight another day with somehow, some way. And pe- people have to remember, too, that uh, with someone like a Damian Priest under the previous regime, as we say, it may have been a di- different story. Mm-hmm. Under the current regime, we all know that when Paul Levesque, Triple H, sees something in someone, he does see something, and he's going to utilize that to the best of their ability. And he's going to guide them. There was talk earlier today on, on Busted Open on – putting your other compadres over there, uh, Justin, where it's a different era where you would come back to Gorilla and Vince would be sitting in the corner with his glasses on and you knew you were in trouble when he did this. Yeah. Give you the old come over here, here. And very rarely complimented. So he just sat there in his corner doing his thing and managing the show under Triple H. 
my understanding now, he's very open when people come back. He's very congratulatory. He's welcoming them, welcoming them, welcoming them back to, you know, and giving them their props when they need it and also giving advice when they need it. So he's very open and receptive. And I think Damien Priest under this regime will flourish. Uh, before and, I was going to say, I don't think that professionalism can be understated either. Like, that's so important um, in in any business. Because if you think about who is professional, Cody Rhodes. Like, when you see Cody Rhodes in a situation, uh, he he hand, the way he handles himself is one reason he's in the position he is now. Not just how good he is in the ring, but how good he is outside the ring. Yeah. And just kind of while we're on this topic at the moment here, again, what we're looking at, you know, again, new administration, new regime, new eras, all these words being thrown around. <clears throat> Jimmy, I won't throw to you first, and I don't know if you have anything you want to say because I know that you worked for and or with all of the individuals I'm about to mention. So, Matt, I'll mm-hmm. go to you first because you can kind of just give an honest um, you know, spectator's view here. What I think we, What I think can't be lost in all this is that, you know, Triple H is being touted for – where the direction they're moving in, rightfully so. And Stephanie McMahon resurfaces Vince's daughter and is touting and standing by her husband and the new era the company's moving towards. And it's, it's very easy for us as fans to cheer and be happy because we're reaping the benefits. We're getting the best product. We're getting a better product than we've gotten in recent years. But what, get, but what shouldn't be lost is that specifically to those two people, there's a real, there's a very real personal family dynamic there. Mm-hmm. This is her father, and this is his father-in-law. This is the grandfather of their children, and and they're having to step in, and and they're getting these praise and accolades for, in some respects, the word I would say is rescuing the company, because Vince's name is right now going down in flames of ac- of, of allegations. That's you know, put yourself in, in your shoe put yourself in their shoes of if that was your father or your father in law or, or your children's grandfather. That's just a wild I I I don't know if a documentary will one day be made or a movie will be made, but that's that's a that that's a, that's a deeply personal dynamic. Absolutely. And I get the impression that those battles have been fought and those solutions have been reached. Yeah. The relationship is whatever the relationship is now seems to have been established um, of at least a few months, maybe a year or two ago. Everybody was surprised that, you know, a lot of rumors about Triple H and Stephanie and their marriage. Um, But it seems like they're together. But it's got to be heartbreaking uh, for everybody involved. You know, it's got to be heartbreaking to not be able to have a relationship with your dad, you know, when you did, you know. And it's got to be heartbreaking if you have a relationship to go, well, we're going to work now and your name can never be mentioned on air. That's gotta be tough. Um, the name's on air, Stephanie's there. So the name continues, but uh, I believe those ties or have been severed or the relationship has been established as what it is now a while ago. Yeah, and that is interesting. She, she's going by, she's still being referred to as Stephanie McMahon. She's not being referred to as Stephanie Levesque. Right. Um, that would be worse. That yeah. would be worse, I think, because that would say that would be a, a overt action. A clean cut. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, clean cut. And and the other thing too that people uh, tend to forget is Stephanie was going to be handed the keys to the car when Vince's time was done originally, so uh, yeah. it wasn't going to be Shane. No. So uh, that 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 speaks volumes for her as well. Yeah. They they all seem to agree on Shane. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, it's wild. It's um, again, like I said, it's a it's a documentary or a Hollywood movie. It's actually. Succession, is what it is. Yeah. You yeah. know, if you've seen Succession, that's that family. It is, it is, it, is, it money is a crazy thing. Yeah. When you start talking billions of dollars, it's a crazy thing. Yeah, indeed. All right, moving right along here, uh, we get the uh, <laughs> the Judgment Day is trying to celebrate Priest and Rhea as champions. Uh, and then our truth inserts himself to to pose down with them, and then here comes Miz, and now we're getting a showdown of we're gonna have Miz and we're gonna have Awesome Truth versus Judgment Day. Uh, but then Truth says we got a third partner, but you can't see him. Yeah. And eventually, here comes John Cena to make the fourth quarter rescue of the match. So Cena with Miz and Truth beats JD McDonough. Uh, Finn Balor and Dirty Dom. Uh, and Matt, I mean, this is just good old. 
fun. I mean, of course, our truth who's our truth who is I think six years older than John Cena. <laughs> John is his childhood hero. He does all the moves. They all do all the Cena moves and tribute and 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 and, and together. Uh, I mean, not, there's not much really to break down analytically. This is just full, a lot of fun. Full circle on that, you know, but also the patience of the Triple H era again. We're just you know slobbering all over the guy, but uh, you know they went three segments before yeah. Cena showed up. And then also, you know, we've heard that Cena can't get physical, you know, and Cena runs to the ring, he sprints to the ring, then very carefully goes up the steps. He did not slide in the ring. <laughs> We're used to him just running in, but he ran, he's like, uh, no, do, 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 do. <laughs> walk up the steps. So I think he's filming Peacemaker right now. He Well, he, yeah. he said yeah, on Pat yeah, McAfee yeah. today that he's getting ready to go, uh, you know, he's got, yeah, he's got. He's got this movie to f- finish filming that they started pre-strike in Europe, and then he's got Peacemaker Two. He, and he, all he, everything he talked, he's got a thing with Honda. He's a keynote speaker for Samsung in Vegas. Yeah. Everything he talked about took him through Christmas. To which he said, "I'm hoping maybe 2025 I can come back for one final run." Right. Uh, Jimmy, I mean, Matt makes a great point. They did not just have Cena just come right out. They let the three on two handicap angle build for a while until Cena does make the save and does limit his. Uh, physical need but this is a lot of fun here no that's exactly what it was supposed to be a lot of fun and it was a great call not to have him come out right away because everybody knew it was inferred by ron uh our killing sorry uh ron our truth oh, boy i'm getting confused here it was a you can't see him it's kind of stuff and Miz played off it really well what do you mean you can't see him somebody you know and that sort of stuff but you're right. Uh, the, uh, it was a nice catch by Matt, Matt over there where he said he carefully went up the steps. He didn't do the Charles Robinson WrestleMania 24 or sprint down to the ring and dive under the bottom rope, which would have been awesome because you never know. You, you could trip and fall, and th- people don't realize. Now they have that big screen in front of yeah, that. It's an LED it's board. A, yeah. It's an LED board there. Before, it was just the, the ring apron, but in the middle of the ring apron is this solid steel pole that's a support. <laughs> Just ask Titus O'Neil. Exactly. Just exactly. Ask. My goodness. You you fall and trip and run into that thing. Good night, nurse. Yeah. Just, just ask Titus. If uh, if Cena would have pulled what Titus did and saw he'd been what, 2018 or whatever that was. Yes. <laughs> that's, that's a bad day at work. Yeah. All right. So John Cena's back. So, so possibly the last time we're going to see John in 2024 on uh, live WWE programming. So hope you soak that one in. Want to call out a note to a video we got coming back from the block of commercial breaks of the Celtic warrior Seamus. And now I tweeted this and I'll share it with both of you gentlemen to get your response. They show this video of Seamus highlighting Seamus properly. And, but the sound bites are narration from Michael Cole over the years of how Seamus has won a world title. He's won the United States title. He's won tag titles. So the one title that's not mentioned in there, he's never won the IC, if you if you read into those sound bites. And as soon as that video is done, we fade back up to the ring, and it's time for Sami Zayn to have his tag match, our current and new IC champion. Jimmy, as we as Matt so eloquently put it a minute ago, we're slobbing all over Triple H. So I'll, 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 I'll give you one more. Nothing happens by coincidence. No. I don't think that's a coincidence that you put that video sandwiched in between the Sami Zayn promo and the Sami Zayn match. What a novel concept is to have reasons for everything happening. Oh boy, I'm glad that's happening at least. And and it makes perfect sense. And I like the fact that we haven't seen Sheamus and we didn't do the whole surprise thing where he runs in and does something. We're building to it. We're making anticipation happen here because Sheamus is a maybe there's a place where uh, uh where he could do it in scotland i don't know what the what the um the heat Lions, is between li- scotland and well, ireland no but, li- but, but no let his first big match be back in france i'm sure the people in ireland would travel to france to see him yeah, yeah i'm sure they would yeah. i'm sure they would but uh and then teasing that next week to him and chad gable i like that in his hometown of montreal Old school booking would have had him lose <laughs> in his hometown because that's what you do so weird <laughs> Yeah, yeah. But, so Seamus, yeah. Seamus video, and then as Jimmy just alluded to, Matt, uh, we got a tag match of Sami Zayn and Chad Gable beating Kaiser and Vinci of Imperium. No Gunther this week, or no Gunther tonight, getting a, probably a little bit of a rest. And then later, backstage, uh, Sami Zayn offers Chad Gable 
an IC title match next week in Montreal. Uh, what'd you make of the Sheamus video? And then as we transition into uh, the first week here of Sami Zayn as IC champ. You know, um, with the Sheamus thing, it's perfect because it gives uh, Sami Zayn an opponent where we all know, we've seen it a million times, we're moving Gunther up. That's what's happening. He's losing the mid-card title, he's moving up. But uh, plotline-wise, why why isn't he going after the IC title? Well, Sheamus is there. Sheamus is taking the spot. We're not going to miss Gunther in that spot. It's perfect. Um, Montreal, the thing seems kind of... Uh, strange that they're having like this uh, good guy good guy match in montreal where sammy's so over like crazy so i wouldn't be surprised if maybe sheamus came out there and attacked him or maybe an attempted heel turn by gable because it seems like we all know sammy Zayn in montreal is electric so i would expect mm -hmm. there's more than meets the eye there uh you know it's uh great points matt i um prior to seeing the sheamus video I would have thought, because I even thought this maybe would happen at WrestleMania when I, when, cause I did not think Guthrie was going to lose on the record. Did not think Guthrie predicted Guthrie to win. I was wrong. Thought maybe there might have been a Chad Gable heel turn. That didn't happen. I noticed something tonight with Chad Gable on the back, and this might this might have been the case for weeks, but I just noticed it tonight on the back of his uh, singlet on his ring gear on the top near his. There, there's he has the Olympic rings. And of course, he's an Olympic uh, former Olympic athlete. And I got me thinking, I was like, you know, I'd like to see Chad get a, a change in things, maybe go heel. Maybe that would be just a, something just fresh for him. But then we've seen these USA and NBC commercials where they show us WWE programming. It's dubbed in French and it's all promoting the Olympics of summer in Paris. And I'm like, you know what? Chad Gable is obviously part of WWE. He's part of this NBC family. Chad Gable's got the Olympic rings on his gear. He's I'm like. Maybe he's got to stay face. Maybe they're gonna. Maybe they're gonna somehow use Chad Gable as part of promotion or cross promotion or something. Or maybe he appears at the Olympics in Paris. So that's that, that basically that killed my thought of him being a heel. Is what is what I'm getting at here. Um, but you're right. A, a baby first, baby face first, baby face. Kind of odd for them to do, but that's what they're gonna go next week in Montreal. So yeah, Seamus crashing the party seemed like that would fit uh, perfectly. If I could, if I could just make one point to their match yeah. at WrestleMania with, with Sammy and Gunther, and yeah. I know a lot of people are going to chew me out on on social media for this, but go ahead, I don't care. I have thick skin. I, <laughs> you know what I mean. That spot that they did in the corner where Sammy gave him the brainbuster on the top turnbuckle, I know it's people are going to say, yeah, but you complained when they did it elsewhere and all kinds of stuff. That's because someone got dropped in their head. Sammy and Gunther pulled that off perfectly where Sammy protected him the way he's supposed to protect him. Gunther didn't hit his head at all. If you go back and look at it, Sammy did a wonderful job of protecting him and made it look great. Where the people you saw, 70,000 people went, oh, and that's the reaction you want. And it's tough pulling those moves off because it takes two, but they did it wonderfully. You know, and Sammy's done that move a thousand times and never in WWE. You know, like that was his move, you know, that was his move when he was on the indie scene was that corner brain buster off. <laughs> it looks yeah. like, it looks just insane, right? But God, what a, you know, like what a new PLE thing, a Paul Levesque era thing to do, allow that very risky, dangerous move, but only at WrestleMania by someone who he knows can pull it off. It's not something you need to see every week. You need to see it once a year. It's a great move. I have to say it. We don't need a twisting, burning 450 Hammer Phoenix splash every week. And there it is. All right, let's get into a few. Uh, let's get into a few raw debuts. Uh, this first one, being uh, Chelsea Green was mad at all the GMs that she was left off of WrestleMania, and she wants an important match. So collaboration is done by the GMs to serve her up uh, a raw after Mania moment, and that is Jade Cargo. And Jade makes quick work, less than twenty seconds, with Chelsea. Um, Jay Cargo made her WrestleMania debut in that six woman tag. Uh, looked like a million bucks there. Uh, followed up again here. Uh, I mean, Jimmy, um, thoughts on the Jay Cargill WWE run so far in its, in its short history here? Well, like you took the words right out of my mouth. They made her look like a million bucks, not only at WrestleMania, but tonight. That entrance, even with the smaller uh, entrance way, it, she still looked like a star. And that posing that she did, she looks confident. She looked, I think what they. The work they did with her in NXT definitely helped with not only her in ring, but with her presentation, because Sean down there is a master telling them, this is how you need to present yourself, be you, but also amp it up to amp the volume up to 12. And, and that's what she did tonight. 
Yeah, and J.R. Smith, the $2 Super Chat, saying, so how hot is Jade? Uh, well, absolutely. And, 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 and to that point, Matt. I'll take uh, that uh, very, yeah. extremely. <laughs> well, and, uh, Matt, to, to, to kind of continue what Jimmy was just saying, I think what's something interesting here is the hands that she is in, uh, Paul Levesque and Shawn Michaels, is these are two people who, who do they work with front and center at a time where she was way ahead of the, the game, and that is China. Uh, Jade very much, I, I've said this about Rhea too, and I still stand by it to an extent with Rhea uh, as a female who has a unorthodox female size, who's bigger than some of the boys, who can out muscle some of the boys, who has that, that kind of aura. And I'll say the same thing about Jade too, whereas if, if China was, if, if, if you know, rest in peace, if China was with us today, where she actually had a full women's locker room to work with, of actual women, not just. You know, Terry, <laughs> right? Yeah. You know, I, I saw her at Mania 17, and she squashed Ivory, and Ivory was probably the best female they had in the locker room at the time in terms of wrestling. Um, if they had, if China was with us today, it would be what we're seeing of Rhea, what we'd be seeing of Jade. And so, to Jimmy's point, you, Jade has Triple H and Shawn Michaels there fostering her, and they, again, they saw China front and center and road and, and travel the road through her. So, I think that's a very interesting just dynamic to think about of past to present now. Well, there is that, but also the fact that they kind of lucked into this uh, triumvirate of uh, uh, Bianca, Naomi, and Jade. And, you know, it made me think about the history of factions and angles in, in wrestling, and very few involve women. Like, you got The Shield, you got the NWO, you got DX, you got all this stuff. Man, those three, when you see them together, you're like, that is bucks, that is money. I would keep those three together, and I would think about running some kind of huge, never done before angle involving women because you could have Triple H has the ability to put together a really good angle or faction based angle involving women. We've never seen that before. And with those three, man, uh, sign me up. Sign me up because that is, uh, uh, I would keep her with them for as long as possible because I think they're just fantastic together. So let's stick with this for a quick second here. Uh, I'm actually going to bump something up the rundown. I'll a little bit higher here. So Rhea Ripley, <clears throat> of course, retains at WrestleMania. So she is um, gone now. She won at last year's Mania. She's gone into this Mania, retains. So she's now a full year. We see her get attacked backstage by Liv Morgan tonight. So that appears to be Rhea's next uh, immediate challenger. But overall, the, the, a big thing I've had, a big question I've had is, who do I realistically believe is going to beat Rhea Ripley right now? She is just so dominant that... So I, I want to ask you guys this, um, Jade Cargo. What's what, what what's the biggest money match? Is it is it is it is it segueing yourself to a Jade Bianca? Obviously, just just the stare down they had at Rumble got people on their feet. Is it Jade and Bianca? Is it Jade being somebody who could finally stop a, a potentially two year title run of Rhea Ripley? What what do you? get you the most fired up jimmy i'll go to you first uh i hate to be the fence sitter here but all of the above start <laughs> okay. with bianca to build her up and to be the person to finally relieve rhea ripley of her championship i think that's the the course they should take slow and steady wins the race as they say take your time with jade let her get acclimated to the surroundings let her get acclimated to being in the ring with these already polished ladies and let her get polished as well in the meantime before she's ready to be anointed as a champion. Matt, what say you on the excitement of uh, what do you want to see with Jade? Well, I don't, nece I don't necessarily agree uh, to see her at a higher plane than Bianca. You know, I think Bianca is just as, as just a big upside, probably about the same age. You know, um, uh, they both are fantastic. Bianca's, like Jimmy said, a little more polished. I think uh, you have to be careful with Jade. Um, but I think... You know, if you really want to get her there, it's Charlotte. You know, I think that they, they alluded to that before. Charlotte's injured when she comes back. That's kind of, you know, if you're going to have a stepping stone, and I hate for Charlotte to be a stepping stone, but to me, you know, Charlotte's on the end of her peak, and Jade is, is the future. So you gotta you got to really make a statement with Jade, her beating somebody like a Becky, like a you know, like a Charlotte. And then you've got a whole bunch of women, I think, that can compete with Rhea, where you've got Bianca, you've got Jade, maybe even a Tiffany Stratton, maybe some of the NXT call-ups. Uh, they have a, a superwoman 
uh, superwoman uh, uh, cavalcade coming from NXT. So I don't think there's going to be any shortage of, of fantastic women wrestlers. So I was curious, man, when you just said that. I was curious where the, where the age was. And not to be ageist, because obviously we see these performers, you know. Bianca's like three years older, maybe? Uh, Bianca, so today is her birthday. Bianca today mm-hmm. turned 35 oh, years old. Happy birthday, birthday, Bianca. Yep. Uh, and I don't have an exact date, month or date, but according to the internet, if the internet is true, uh, the birth year is 1992, so Jade is 31 years of old. So, yeah, just about... 1992, wow. Yeah, a few, few years Everyone. younger than Bianca. But, I watched uh, the Dream Team play that year. That's crazy. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, lot to watch for... Um, We'll keep an eye on, on where that goes, but again, just so much stuff to be exciting about, excited mm-hmm. about. Uh, so last two things. So we touched on Rhea being attacked by Liv, touched on Jade. A uh, few other uh, debuts we saw tonight. Both the NXT Men's World Champion, Ilya Dragunov, got a win on Shinsuke Nakamura, unadvertised, and an unadvertised appearance by NXT Women's Champion, Roxanne Perez. She gets a victory over Indy Hartwell. Uh, Matt, one thing we can all now, again, certainly agree upon in this era is there will be much more... Uh, what's the word? Synergy <laughs> between NXT and Raw and SmackDown. It will not they, be. They won't call up opponents as tag team partners anymore. <laughs> oh. Yes, <laughs> yeah, so we will not be seeing Alistair Black with uh, who was Ricochet. It, Ricochet. It was Ricochet. Yeah. 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 Uh, we, we, there will be some synergy as as, as 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 Paul could pick up the phone and talk to Sean and say, "Hey, here's what we're gonna do. Let's make it make sense." Well, you know. It's great, right? And we're seeing a lot more acceptance of what's going on in NXT. But I would challenge WWE, not that they're listening to me, but I've always wanted there to be a storyline reason why NXT talent goes up. It still seems kind of random and and unpredictable. Maybe it could be as simple as if you win the title, you get to go on Raw for a match match or something. Mm -hmm. But I think some kind of storyline reason, storyline um justification for NXT talent to be called up because right now it seems like anybody can be called up for any reason at any time and I think that's the next little step they need to fine tune that synergy Hmm. yeah I'd be wondering Jimmy if uh, again I've always tried to make this case that can we try not to have NXT viewed as AAA compared to the major leagues can we try to let it be as much of a third brand as possible Uh, I don't know if this Tonight helps. I mean, it's nice to see both NXT champions come up and win. Right. If they would have had them lose, <laughs> even if it's a non-title match, it would have just yeah. been ridiculous. Like when Charlotte came up and yeah. lost. Right. Cincinnati. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, Who's so called was that? Hmm. Okay. Never mind. Right. So, like, I mean, you know, I, I don't know how far can – and look, in the draft, real quick before you answer, the draft is coming up at the end of the month. They did announce that the draft's coming up at the end of the month. And tonight we saw both Raw and SmackDown GMs and – NXT GM Ava Rain. So that definitely gave me off the vibes that we might see NXT acquire some talent uh, to a kin like a Baron Corbin's, a talent who have been on Raw or SmackDown for years who are going to move over to NXT and just find a spot there. Uh, again, that further kind of ha- maybe helps the narrative of NXT not looking like so much like a step down, but just right. a step over. That was the first step to alluding to that, at least, anyways, so to make them feel like that they're going to be somewhat more in play and feel less of a, like you said, a triple a team. And I like the idea of bringing them up on the Monday after WrestleMania, because that is the most viewed raw of the year as we've seen over the past several years. So it gives them a bigger platform to, to an audience that may not be watching NXT to go, Hey, you know what? Let me check out this NXT product. Maybe there's something there that I'm going to like, at least it gives them an idea to go check it out. At, yeah. Maybe. And you keep know. in mind, NXT is moving later this year to the CW. So CW, yeah, whatever that, yeah. whatever that, whatever that means, they're moving. Yeah, exactly. So, like I said, gives them a bigger platform on the biggest draw of the year. So hopefully that helps them drive up some numbers and some interest. And and like you said, the the draft is coming up, and maybe there there is something in play there with with the three jams in the locker room there conversing. Yeah. Uh, last thing, I didn't put it on the rundown, but just a real quick thing to note. Uh, it was kind of like a little bit of one of those Easter eggs that they like to do. Uh, Bronson Reed's doing a backstage promo about having won the Andre the Giant out of Royal. There was a little distortion that went on uh, on the screen to his promo. And then if you search heavily on X on Twitter, to those who were there live, at one point when they were in uh, commercial break in the arena, they cut away 
blackened the house and played some sound and a, a rough sketch video that I couldn't make out all of what was being said. Basically, everybody saying that it was a, an Uncle Howdy uh, promo teaser. And if you if you watch the Peacock documentary on the late Bray Wyatt at the very very end, there's a a call to of there might be continuing the the, the Uncle Howdy character. So. Um, whether or not that's going to be dedicated to Bronson Reed specifically or whether we're going to have to watch each week and see it sprinkled through the program. But nonetheless, it appears the legacy of the Bray Wyatt characters and universes is going to continue. Uh, Matt, uh, I, I'm throwing this on you. I didn't put it on the sheet, but uh, did I don't know if you caught any of that on the show tonight. I don't know if you caught the Bray Wyatt Peacock documentary, but any thoughts to, to the Uncle Howdy character seemingly going to uh, continue on? Uh, you know, it's great. <laughs> with respect for Bray, of course, everything Bo Dallas has done. I'm not sure of Bo Dallas's uh, ability to carry out the 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 thing. I, I hope he can. I, I think he's a great wrestler, and also not sure fans really connect with the with the with the Howdy character. But um, I'm for it. I'm for trying it. I think Bo Dallas is a good wrestler. He deserves the opportunity, and why not give a shot and see if we can get this uh, Bray Wyatt world. Uh, continuing and let it be a legacy. Yeah. Uh, Jimmy, thoughts? No, I kind of agree with Matt. I, I don't see why not giving it a shot at least. You, you Again, you don't know unless you try. And uh, the best barometer to anything is how the crowd reacts, especially the live crowd. Uh, it used to be back in the day, you would try stuff on the house shows, mm -hmm. the live events to see what kind of reaction it would get. If it got a reaction, okay, let's try it on TV. If it didn't get a reaction, uh, no, you know what? Let's think of something else. In this world, it's now... Let's give it a shot on TV and see how it resonates. Right. So why not? Just give it a shot. And I will say it's apparent that the plan was to put Bray in the Hall of Fame and the family just wasn't ready to go through all that yet. Right. You know, and, and you put the dad in, you put the uncle in, you have the documentary, you have all these different things. You have the return of Bo Dallas to TV. Um, and they just weren't ready to go through all that trauma yet. So mm -hmm. when they're ready, you know, us fans will be ready for Bray to be in the Hall of Fame. You saw how his dad, how emotional he was at the Hall of Fame. It was, it was heart, it was, it was endearing, but it was also heartbreaking. There was the a time. point where you heard the music play, and the and the crowd went dark, and you heard a man weep, and I think that was uh, Mike Rotundo. You yes. know, like you you heard like a guy weep over that sound. So I think he was still on the mic. I don't know how you deal with a thing like that, but um, bless them all. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, it's something. So we'll we'll see where that goes. Uh, we'll keep an eye on the Uncle Howdy teases moving forward. But uh, that was Monday Night Raw. That was Raw after Mania in the books. And uh, tune into SmackDown because I, you know, SmackDown seems like it's going to give us some some compelling content. Uh, as we alluded to earlier, probably going to figure out or find out rather who Cody Rhodes' first uh, new foe is going to be uh, now that he is world champion we're we're all kind of accepting like it's not roman right we're, we've all just kind of moved on we're like it's not roman we don't do rematches anymore in 2024 yeah no i, I mean i, I think and I, I think we all kind of disagree like roman's gonna deserve least I, I know it's ridiculous to say because he hadn't had a title defense since rumble and he's part-time but <clears throat> the guy's been champion for 1316 days we can let him go home for a little bit and... he's rich let him do his thing <laughs> exactly <laughs> Exactly. But it doesn't hurt to have it one more time at least. <laughs> so we'll see where it goes here. But the Triple H era is about exceeding expectations. So, like, you never know what's going to happen on SmackDown. I can't believe I'm saying that. I'm, like, shilling for the company now. <laughs> <laughs> How dare you? Oh, Tune in. <laughs> oh, your, 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 your Twitter's going to look like mine. Uh, <laughs> beware. Well, you know, I am... Uh, Technically, the Canadian heat magnet. So, what can I tell you? That's you are, Jimmy. Jimmy, <laughs> final uh, final thoughts, final plugs. Do the deal. No, I, I thought Raw was fine. I like it. Progressed the in the new er, era, the new regime, and got a lot of stuff in play. We got Cody in play. We got new talent from NXT coming up, displaying their wares. There, you know, the CM Punk Drew thing. Pl a lot of seeds planted, and looking forward to the future. And as far as where you can catch me, obviously here on Monday nights. Uh, doing my thing after Raw and also Wednesday nights after Dynamite. You can catch me on the Reffin' It Up podcast with my good brother in stripes, Brian Hebner, who joined me in Philly this week, and we had a blast catching up with old friends and just, you know, 
you'll see pictures on my Twitter and all that sort of stuff with a bunch of old guys that I just ran in. old guys. I'm one of them. Hell, <laughs> but, uh, had a blast and, uh, you can catch me on my rough and rants on from Monday to Friday, just, you know, giving my little critiques and putting a lot, I'm going to try and keep it more positive to see and, and see how that works out <laughs> lately. Cause people, uh, I I'm, I'm, kind of kind of shy away from the negative not negativity i'm not trying to be negative it's just critique it's honest critique to help tighten the screws and help better and you know that's that's the way i'm doing it and like i say the opinions on my reference are those of mine and mine alone jamie corderas with his uh coffee black uh tightening the screws giving oh. critiques to and also doing a little corderas karaoke lately so oh boy as you got a sample of it last week jess <laughs> That, 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 that should be behind a paywall. But, people, should, but, people should have to pay for that. No, by the way, by the way, really quick, I did it for LaGreca <laughs> oh, <laughs> at really? the Boston Open Party behind the backstage, and he loved it. He, but uh, that, you know, you know, Dave, anything Cody, he loves. <laughs> oh, I thought, I thought you were gonna tell me I'm gonna be pitched. I got a new segment on Sundays. I gotta have you <laughs> sing karaoke on Sunday morning or something. Hey, maybe. Yeah. You know, never mind. <laughs> Matt Coon, thanks for joining us tonight. We always appreciate having you. Uh, final thoughts, final plugs. Well, I'll be here Friday, I believe. And um, it's always great to be here on Wrestling Inc. Final thoughts, guys. It's it's uh, after midnight, so it's Tuesday, April 9th, 2024. And somehow, WWE Raw is the most compelling wrestling show on television. Go figure. Good job, dude. Good job, Paul. You know, you killed it. Uh, you can reach me over at Twitter at Matt Coon Music, where I will argue with you and probably curse at you if you annoy me. Uh, but generally, it's fun times. Come and visit me over there. Uh, thanks for having me, guys. This was great. Very good. Thank you for having us. Uh, Bernie in D.C., who's keeping tabs of uh, Triple J Mania predictions. I guess I came in at 10, Jack wow. at 8, Jimmy at 6. Bringing up the rear. Uh, we'll have to yeah. take a look at the specifics on that one, but uh, thank you, Barney, <laughs> for keeping the score there. Uh, yeah, very fun time. I, I think we've I think we've s s said a lot, but it is a very fun time right now to be a pro wrestling fan, yeah. uh, especially of WWE right now. So uh, we will uh, we will keep on watching. It's a fun time again to be in our position to be uh, paid to talk and shoot the crap about wrestling when wrestling's fun right now. Mm -hmm. I mean, I remember thing. doing those Wade Keller podcasts like four years ago. Where me and him were just like, oh my God, what did we just watch? You know, like, how do we, how do we talk about this? Why do we do this? This is not this. It's great now. Brother, I was in a TV studio in 2011 recording <laughs> three days worth of content <laughs> when things were not that, that things were not that deep. <laughs> so no, I hear you. Just uh, ask Ardo Kell. Yeah, no, no, yeah. Jim, Jimmy, that was, that was the same time where. Yeah. You, me, Josh, Arda, Dave here, and Davey Nelson. We had one event a year to look forward to, and that was Mania for us all to get together and record together in Miami or whatever city, because at least that one gave us enough to talk right. about. <laughs> exactly. Oh, memory yeah. lane. Um, yeah, good time to be wrestling fans. Thanks to everybody who tuned in tonight. Uh, in terms of me, cheap plug, uh, again, here on Monday nights on Wrestling Inc. with the crew. Uh, join me every Friday morning and every Sunday morning, uh, Busted Open Radio, Channel 156, Fight Nation, or the bus or the Sirius XM app or the Siri or the Busted Open podcast. Uh, all things there. I really enjoy the time there. Appreciate the nation uh, continuing to grow and support us. That's going to do it. Uh, follow, like, subscribe, do all the things. Be good to each other. Uh, wrestling is back. Wrestling is fun. So tell a friend, tell a friend. Bring on a new potential viewer. Help the business. Good night. <laughs>